So what does the Dirac quantization for gravity amount to? And are there any, any problems? Or can I just push through uh, this quantization uh, program? So of course, the first difficulty is, of course, that I'm translating this now to a field theoretic context. So I have to be careful, of course, with my operators, etc. cetera. Uh, it requires much more work that these things to prove that things are well defined. However, what one does is usually one just proceeds in analogy uh, kind of with finite dimensions, and one call, one, then, when one sees then of a formal quantization, that just means, well, if everything goes well, if you can make all these relations well defined, I'll comment on this more uh, a little later, uh, then things just might go through. But of course, there's absolutely no guarantee that this happens. So at this formal level, kind of you are thinking of uh, a Hilbert space, of wave functions that depend just on the configuration variables of the classical theory. That is, of course, the analog of the phi of x, right, in quantum mechanics, uh, psi of x. Um, so that's step number one. And then you just promote Poisson brackets to canonical commutators. So that would be to say, of course, I had written down the, uh, the commutations, the Poisson uh, relations for the HIJs and their canonical conjugates on the blackboard yesterday or the day before. And now I just imagine, you know, I have a bunch of self-adjoint operators, you know, obtained by hatting of these classical things. And so I hope these exist in some way. And if they do, I'd like them to satisfy these relations, which are just the quantum analogs of the classical relations. Delta IK, delta JL, plus delta IL, delta JK, delta 3 of X and Y. Well, of course, we are not finished, because then we had these uh, constraints for quantum constraints, uh, classical constraints, which you now want to quantize. So let me again collectively call them curly H mu, not to be confused with the symbol for Hilbert space I've used up there. Um, so this is consists of the uh, H perp, the Hamiltonian constraint, and the three diffeomorphism constraints, HI. And then, according to the Dirac quantization procedure, demand that these quantum constraints should vanish on physical wave functions. I mean, this should kind of project out some uh, physical Hilbert space for me. And lastly, well, I mean, this physical Hilbert space should really be well defined for this auxiliary Hilbert space. Well, to what extent this is necessary is, is, uh, is maybe debatable. But here, we really then want to find kind of a scalar product on the space of these physical wave functions. So to obtain some well-defined Hilbert space, H physical. So this is my kind of the my naive quantization program. This is how I would want to proceed. I mean, in complete analogy with uh, finite dimensional examples. Um, there is a is a host of problems associated with, with this. If I really try to, uh, to, to implement this, let me just mention um, a few of them. And 
write some down. Well, first of all, that's already known kind of from uh, in finite dimensions. If I have this type of uh, kind of Heisenberg algebra relation, so I have you know an x x set with p hat commutator uh, is proportional to the unit, then if I impose kind of standard quantization, the nice thing is that is this is essentially unique. Uh, but uh, certainly classically, uh, sorry, for finite dimension, it implies that both the spectrum of the quantum operator X set and that of P hat is the entire real line. Uh, and certainly, in this case up here, if something similar happens, that would appear to be in conflict with my requirement that the determinant of H should be larger than zero. So it's not the case that all these arguments you know, uh, are allowed to take values over the entire real line. And I would expect that the, the wave function should in some way also know about this. OK, so it's not clear whether this, this type of fundamental uh, commutation relations captures this correctly. Tendentially, not. Um, you, said, you might say, well, maybe I, I, I can uh, get away with this if I consider just certain um, compound objects built up of these fundamental variables. And that, that's in principle possible. Now, uh, another thing which uh, spells trouble is that what we, I mean, what entered in this uniqueness of in, in the uh, Stone von Neumann theorem in finite dimensions is also the Hilbert space itself. And the Hilbert space with respect was square integral function with respect to the Lebesgue measure. I mean, the, 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 what I call the trivial measure, D, DQI. Now, such a Lebesgue measure does not exist naturally in infinite dimension. So that raises the question, of what is it? I mean, what, what, is a, uh, what is a good uh, functional measure? And thirdly, of course, as you, as you have already seen, uh, in these, these constraints are rather complicated functions of the basic variables. And in particular, the Hamiltonian is a very complicated non-polynomial function of the uh, uh, classical phase space variables. And clearly, I'm going to meet uh, even massive operator ordering problems, potentially, in, in quantizing this, even at this very naive uh, 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 level. So there are various problems that are potentially there, but they're not only potentially there. If one really tries to make sense of this, one sees that they are uh, really there. Um, now, one uh, kind of the obvious thing to, to try and do is now M implement, you know, as you would do in finite dimensions, this H i j hat as a multiplication operator and the pi as a functional differential with respect to the H i j's. If you do that, then one can say, okay, let me assume some operator ordering. So I'm just substituting in uh, these dependencies, these, these uh, the quantization, these uh, kind of elementary uh, uh, operators. And a, uh, a popular choice is have, all, uh, have it ordered in such a way that all momenta appear to the right in the constraints. That's, so that's one thing you can do. Uh, what this amounts to for the four uh, quantum constraints is the following. Hi hat acting on a wave function uh, that depends on the hij's is equal to minus 2 dj hi uh, k okay. minus i h bar and now comes the differential operator so that was exactly where I had a, 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 a pi dependence classically that now becomes a partial uh, functional differential on psi, and this is my kind of one of my Dirac uh, conditions on on the wave functions on the physical wave functions. The Hamiltonian constraint. If I do the same thing, um, I end up with a formal kind of quantum operator minus this is kappa squared h bar squared, g 
G I J K L, and then a double derivative, because that was it came from a pi squared term, uh, del by del H I J, del H K L, minus square root of the determinant of H, kappa squared, three dimensional. Curvature acting on psi is equal to zero. So you see, we've kind of formally adopted a Schrödinger type quantization where the momenta are represented by these partial derivatives, and we've, you know, the choice is made that they appear to the right, the derivatives. Because here, of course, there is Hij dependence in these expressions on the left that multiply these differential operators. Okay, so. Uh, a choice definitely has been made. And by deciding to represent these H's uh, as multiplication operators, well, at least you can very easily write down these things. I mean, they just appear, look like classical. This depended on the HIJs, for example. And of course, so does this and the, and the, the partial, uh, the covariant derivative here. <coughs> now, this uh, second equation has its own name. It's called the Wheeler de Witt equation. Also, sometimes abbreviated as WDW equation. It's, of course, a famous name, which you might have heard, even if you don't know too much about quantum gravity. Um, let's have a look about what these mean these expressions or what, what the geometric uh, interpretation uh, uh, might mean. Well, as it turns out, whenever things are just linear in the momenta and therefore kind of linear in these derivatives, I can just think of them as, well, vector field very much in the same way as I did, you know, in my, you know, in my baby example where I set P3 equal to zero, and then had a kind of, uh, uh, could think of, of the action of the associated quantum operator as uh, acting on, on the argument, on, on, the, on, the, uh, 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 on the domain of my wave functions, which there consisted just of the three directions in R3, and just moving along the gauge direction here. And a very similar interpretation is possible when one has constraints that are just linear in the momenta. And I've written them, I mean, the way I've written them here with the, uh, with the differential operator to the right. They also will act, you can think of them as acting kind of on the arguments of the wave function and just moving uh, within that uh, space, H, the Hij space, the super space, moving you in the direction of three-dimensional spatial diffeomorphisms. Okay. So what I mean to imply by this is that they, these constraints, these three constraints, have an inter immediate and straightforward geometric interpretation. So they just move the argument or, of, uh, or they act on the argument of the wave function, that's how you can think of them, as a three-dimensional diffeomorphism would, infinitesimal diffeomorphism would. Okay. And if we compute their uh, algebra, they exactly reproduce the infinite dimensional Lie algebra of the three-dimensional diffeomorphisms. So that's fine. So they, you know, on the face of it, it just means that the three-dimensional diffeomorphism symmetry is kind of exactly uh, reproduced at this level in the quantum theory. And requiring things to be invariant means just has a immediate physical interpretation of saying, aha, these are just wave functions kind of invariant under 3, 3D diffeomorphisms. So they will depend on data that are kind of gauge orbits with respect to these diffeomorphisms. Okay. I'm not saying that it's very easily kind of implemented in practice necessarily, but it's kind of a straightforward mental image of, you know, of what happens. Um, so, this is my comment concerning the 
these hi hats. So they generate cover spatial diffeomorphisms. At the quantum level, and without any anomalies, at least at this very formal level I'm, I'm, I'm using here, and a, a wave function that is annihilated by those is one which depends uh, kind of only on equivalence classes of Hij's. Yeah, so um, if this is a diffeomorphism invariant functional of Hij. So it doesn't depend on Hij, but only on the equivalence class with respect to this uh, group action. So it's a, yeah, a functional on superspace, if by superspace I now understand the space of geom geometries, where I have factored out by this gauge freedom. Now, let's come to this beast here. So the, the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So this is what gives you all the trouble in the, in the canonical quantum theory. So you can already see it's, of course, it's classically already a very involved uh, 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 object, it is more particularly, it's not, it's quadratic in, uh, in these functional derivatives, which also means, so these are so, acting at the same point, so it's highly ill-defined. So this a priori is, doesn't make any specific sense before I have at least, say, regularized kind of the infinities that, that come from this double derivative at the same point. And the issues that have to do with operator ordering and things like, can I implement at the quantum level the full Dirac algebra uh, in some way, can I find a representation which achieves this, is intimately tied to the regularization because, well, Without the regularization, it's only, I mean, the, the, the question is totally ill-posed. So it's only well-posed if I regularize. And then, of course, the regularized operator will then have a certain commutation relation with itself and with these HIJs. And then I have to kind of study and I have to be careful how I smear things out that, uh, well, what, whether I can reproduce in any sensible limit where I remove them these regulators. Uh, say, for example, the, the Dirac algebra, which I would love to do in principle. Yes? Why is it that the second derivative is relative to the first derivative? Getting that oh, yeah, because they depend on the same. This is because of the function equation. I've now suppressed, of oh, course, all the so arguments. The function or something. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yes. So, simple smearing out uh, will not do, so you have to regularize. Regularizes. That's my remark here. Anyway, this is even in standard quantum field theory, this the very same phenomenon would occur. So this must be regularized and potentially renormalized. And well, just the point I also want to make here is that this. This cannot be separated from the factor ordering question. <coughs> now, if you kind of close your eyes to this and just, you know, just formally kind of take, uh, take the commutator uh, of these expressions, then unfortunately you don't reproduce the, the Dirac algebra. Uh, 
uh, not even at any uh, at, at any formal uh, level. So if you just ignore uh, uh, if you just ignore the singularity issue, well, which I, I'm telling you, you shouldn't. Uh, people looked. I mean, when I became interested in quantum gravity, that's a long time ago. Uh, well, people just had been banging their, their heads against the wall, trying to make any sense out of this equation. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, what you have to do in the quantum theory also, well, well this is, a, of course, I, it's straightforward even to, to write down this formal equation, but of course, you have to solve it. And, uh, well, no one has any idea how to go about solving this equation. So basically, uh, one was very much uh, uh, stuck here. Uh, things you can try, um, you can try, of course, I mean, people tried with, with fact, factor orderings, but there is no factor ordering that even formally reproduces the, the Dirac algebra. Um, uh, then you can try and go to a simpler context, and you can say, for example, people uh, look at this problem in, in cosmology. That means you already classically throw out almost all degree of freedom because you say, Oh, let me consider universes that are, you know, homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, so that's what you typically do. It's a very successful approach to describe large-scale cosmology. To what extent it really makes a lot of sense in the quantum theory is, is yet another question. But one can try and do that, and then one meets the Wheeler-DeWitt equation in a much simpler context. Like it looks like a quantum mechanical problem, but even there. In most instances, you have exactly uh, factor ordering problems. I mean, you don't have the singularity problems that arise because we are talking about uh, about a field theory, but you have uh, nasty problems that come. If you recall what I said at the very beginning of uh, the lectures, here we have function uh, of configuration variables times a p squared term. So you always have these factor ordering problems. And of course, you, you can sometimes you find factor orderings for which you then can solve, let's say, a cosmological approximation. What it all means uh, is, is another question. But even in that simplified context, you are very often unable to deal with uh, solving this equation at all. So it's a famous equation. But well, what it has done for us so far is maybe, yeah, is a, is a bit is subject to a debate, uh, I, I would say. So, uh, so, that, so that was my first remark. My second remark so, uh, is that we simply don't know uh, how to solve, how to solve H, uh, uh, H perp hat psi equal to zero. Certainly not in this metric formulation. Uh, and what I start explaining to you a little bit, a bit about today, so what uh, gave new impetus to this canonical quantization program um, about 25 years or so ago was uh, the discovery that uh, with a slightly different choice of basic variables, so not the hijs and their conjugate momenta, but some kind of gauge theory-like variables, um, one can transform this equation into something simpler. And one has a reasonably nice way of treating rather explicitly uh, these diffeomorphism constraints. And that is the framework of so-called loop quantum gravity. And I'll get, uh, I'll get to this in the course of my lecture. Um, <clears throat> after having uh, made uh, some more remarks on this general Hamiltonian scheme. Um, so also one question is, well, what on earth, I mean, what, what's the physical interpretation of this Wheeler-DeWitt equation? And already, of course, classically, we met the somewhat strange feature that, uh, well, this looks very much like a Hamiltonian, but I require it to be to vanish classically. And that's, of course, a quantum analog of this statement. And if I think of a, you know, a standard way uh, of phrasing dynamics, 
course, I'm thinking of something like a, and I have a Hamilton, if I have a Hamiltonian, I think of something like a Schrodinger equation, IH d by dt, time derivative of my wave function, is a h hat. The Hamiltonian, in this case, of course, it's this, this would be the kind of the integrated one over three slices of t acting on psi of t. And recall, this was a linear combination um, with the n's and the ni's of these two sets of constraints. So this seems an equation, uh, an obvious equation one would write down for the quantum theory in gravity in this canonical formalism with the Hamiltonian with some kind of quantized Hamiltonian here on the right-hand side. But of course, by definition, this is just a linear combination of constraints. So on physical wave functions, this vanishes. So, well, this is zero. And then you look at the left-hand side and you think, oh, well, what does that mean? It means uh, all wave functions are constant. I mean, nothing's happening. Uh, and people sometimes call, capture this by, by saying, well, time is frozen, right? Because apparently nothing seems to be happening. Uh, so, but obviously, to conclude that there wouldn't be any interesting evolution uh, in the quantum theory uh, is clearly a wrong conclusion. I mean, it can't be right because, of course, classically, although uh, H is vanishing, uh, of course, there is lots of non-trivial evolution. You know, we have classical classical solution with, uh, with non-trivial time developments. And that clearly we expect also in the classical theory. So again, that, that raises, that then one would conclude, oh, well, oh, yeah, but T meant something quite different in this series than from what it usually means. So, uh, and one of many ways of, uh, of making sense, nevertheless, out of this formalism is uh, uh, to interpret, to look for another notion of time within this physical system, um, which is extracted as, well, will depend on the HRJs and the pi IJs in some way, but will be physically motivated. Uh, and then kind of rewrite even the quantum mechanical expressions as functions of this kind of physical time. And as soon as you do that, then you're back to a more standard formalism where you have a notion of time, and you will have a conjugate uh, a quantity, which you might want to call a, Hamil a real Hamiltonian or an energy. And then you're more in the realm of yeah, familiar descriptions. Whether that's the right thing to do is yet another, you know, is yet another question. Or there is a whole, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages have been written about the problem of time in quantum gravity. And I'm not even trying to convey uh, you know, the depth of the arguments uh, to you in this lecture, because also I simply uh, uh, don't have the time, uh, the time to do this. Um, so um, I wanted to give you, yes, just, just one of the references is by, so this is on the archive, is by Isham, kind of a classic paper to see. Nine two one oh oh one. One is called Canonical Quantum Gravity and the Problem of Time, and it has about 120 pages or so. Uh, and there are more extensive uh, other papers and, and books, uh, some of them with, with Aishan as a, as a co author. So he was really authority uh, on these time questions, uh, and still is, uh, where one discusses all possible alternatives to extract the time. What it means is it's there, is it not there? Um, so I recommend that if you, uh, if you're interested in the details. Of course, it somewhat hampered these discussions by the fact that we have no real, you know, complete quantizations available. You know, if we had lots of different quantizations, and the, you know, quantization A treats time in a certain way, quantization B treats time in another way, and then you would get results from those, and then you could start comparing the results. Well, then think life would maybe be easier to decide what's a reasonable strategy. But we don't really have, we are, we are not in the state uh, uh, for, for the most part to do this. Okay, now, 
Here, as I mentioned briefly, one appeared to be a little bit stuck with this kind of standard uh, uh, canonical uh, formulation in terms of these uh, metric variables, geometric variables, as they're sometimes called. Um, and here now uh, came a bunch, a new idea, a fresh idea, how you might reformulate uh, the classical theory totally equivalently in terms of a bunch of different variables, which would then suggest different ways of going about uh, the, the quantization and the canonical quantization in particular. And these new variables, they're called connection variables. And, well, the key person to put them on the map uh, was uh, Ashtaka. This was in 1986. And this led then to what is now known as loop, or has been known for quite some time, as loop quantum gravity. 